event. He is going to complete the task of uh, Dr. Samir. Dr. Samir started uh, talking about uh, uh, spurious or uh, thyroid function testing, and he has proposed uh, medications as uh, one of the causes for such a presentation. Uh, today, we are going to hear about interferences that cannot be elicited from taking history from the patient. We are going to, uh, to, to hear about uh, some new terms that are not uh, present in the under, uh, undergraduate course. So I'm going to, uh, to, to hear about uh, macro TSH, how would rheumatoid factor interfere with thyroid function testing, and uh, Ahmed, inshallah, is going to elaborate all of these interferences. Go ahead, Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Uh, you've made my task uh, either easier because you mentioned uh, many of the concepts, or either difficult because I can't imitate you. You are my mentor, of course, and uh, you are my role model. But it would be very difficult to, uh, to go after you. Uh, I'm going to speak about laboratory interference in thyroid function testing from a clinical standpoint of view. And uh, we are going to present case of a 35-year-old woman who presented with tiredness for six months. She has palpitations, her ACG is normal, she having, she's having uh, iron and multivitamins. When examination, her pulse is 60 beats per minute, she has no goiter, and the general practitioner have sent, has sent the patient for us for the clinical impression of there is something with the thyroid. Surprisingly, her TSH was more than 100, uh, and more surprisingly, at this very high TSH, her free T4 was normal, 17 comol per liter. And Dr. Samir has shown us this nice graph which shows the seven patterns of thyroid function tests. And we are in this uh, part. We are in the free T4 and free T3, which are normal and very high TSH, either subclinical hypothyroidism or assay interference. So I'm going to concentrate more about uh, assay interference. Uh, we know that there are some conditions in which measurement of TSH is misleading. And one of these conditions is TSH, -A, TSH assay interference. Again, we've heard about central hypothyroidism, TH secreting pituitary adenoma, resistance to thyroid hormones in this uh, conference. So what do we mean by interference? Interference is the effect of a substance present in the sample change the correct value of the result for an analyte. Analyte is the same is the thing we are going to measure. For example, here it is the TSH. So interference, a substance which is present in the sample, changing the correct value of the result for the analyte. Interference could be suspected in a patient when the TSH is very high. It's free T4 and free, uh, free T3 are normal especially if they are in the upper half of the normal range. And there, again, there are no symptoms, no signs of thyroid dysfunction. Well, Dr. Samir has shown us uh, uh, these two sites, immune assay, and we have talked about uh, antirudinium, protein, and antistriptyzine. Now we are more concerned with the heterophilic antibodies and the macro TSH. Again, in antibody interference, uh, I don't know why. Antibody interference in thyroid hormone assays may be due to antibodies against assay antibodies or against thyroid hormones or against assay antibody detection molecules. What are heterophile antibodies? Heterophilic antibodies are weak, specific antibodies formed early in the immune response prior to affinity maturation. We act with immunoglobulins derived from at least two species. We know that immune present in the kids are mostly animal derived, for example, from mice. And so we expect that they are going to interact and react with these uh, kids. The prevalence of these antibodies is 30 to 40 percent and can interfere with the methods that use immunometric assays. Rheumatoid factor actually is one of this category because it reacts against the FC region of the human immunoglobulins, displaying cross-reactivity against animal antibodies. And it has been shown to interfere with free and total thyroid hormone tests. Human anti animal antibodies, the HAAA, are monospecific high affinity antibodies directed against animal epitopes, goats, rabbits, sheep, horses, or more frequently mice. 
is what we call them EMA, the human anti-mouse antibodies. And since most of the kids are driven from mice, so we expect these antibodies are going to react with the kids. So the difference between these three groups of antibodies, the heterophilic antibodies, the human anti-mouse antibodies, and the rheumatoid factor, uh, clinically, we do not uh, take much interest in this difference because in daily laboratory practice, the term heterophilic antibody is typically used whenever one suspects a patient sample contains antibodies that cause false results by binding the assay antibodies. And for the sake of simplicity, in this review, we will consider two heterophilic antibodies and HAAA together because they may bring about similar types of assay interference. What happens normally? Normally, the TSH to be measured, we depend on an immobilized affixed phase, which is the capture antibody. And then we add the serum, which contains the TSH, the analyte. It will bind to the capture antibodies, and then comes the rule of the detection antibodies. The detection antibodies will not bind to the complex unless the capture antibodies and the TSH are together in the same uh, complex. However, if there is a heterophilic antibody which cross-links the capture and the detection antibodies, even in the absence of the analyte TSH, we are going to find a false positive result, a false elevated result. This is the most common scenario. At least common scenario, and less common scenarios may find that the antibodies, the heterophilic antibodies, bind to the uh, detector or to the capture antibodies, leaving the TSH alone without binding to any antibodies, to any antibodies and resulting in negative say, interference. This is least common. More common is the first type, which is the cross link between the capture antibodies and the label antibody or the detector antibody. What are the clinical outcomes of such interaction? Of course, it will result also elevated results with unnecessary follow-up examination, unnecessary investigations that are done, and forced therapy decisions. And misclassification of monitoring results it may increase the dose or decrease the dose uh, depending on false results. And of course, this will result and will affect the patient's prognosis. For example, this another, uh, another case study of a 10-year-old boy who presented with fatigue and short stature. Again, the impression of the general practitioner was something in the thyroid because TSH was 17. So the free to fall was normal and the TBO antibodies were negative. This is biochemically the same pattern as subclinical hypothyroidism. And it may lead to inappropriate levothyroxine therapy. And this is what happened. Boy was commenced on levothyroxine therapy treatment with progressive increase in the dose up to 100 micrograms per day. And every time the parents were asked about medication adherence at each visit, over the TSH remained high, remained high, and the free T4 went up, went to the thyrotoxic, went to the upper, upper than normal, higher than normal. After two years of the thyroxine treatment, testing with heterophilic antibodies, talking studies confirmed interference. And the TSH was normal with treated serum. Patient thyroxine treatment was ceased and the thyroid function remained normal. So this is the importance of interference because here we give treatment that is not needed. Prevalence of interference depends on the immunoassay. We have many types of immunoassay as Dr. Samir mentioned. In this study, which included 5,000 patients, the heterophilic antibodies against TSH incidence was to be 0.4%. So it is not that common. However, it exists. It is there. How can the manufacturer reduce heterophilic antibodies? We use blocking proteins, fragmentation of antibodies, use of chimeric monoantibodies. I'm not going through all of this because it is more interest of for the clinical pathologist. We only have uh, an idea about blocking agents. For example, this is a blocking immunoglobulin that blocks the action of heterophilic antibodies, leaving the TSH free uh, to be sandwiched by the captured antibodies and the detector antibody. 
can the lab do to detect immunoassay interference? We can repeat the analysis with an alternative immunoassay with a different species, for example, replacing mice for sheep, treating the sample with an additional blocking agent, hydrophilic blocking tubes or scanty tubes, or dilute the sample where nonlinearity indicates assay interference. Again, we should remember a negative interference test does not exclude interference. There may be interference that we cannot detect. And this is a case, uh, this is all the cases that were published in uh, literature from 1981 uh, regarding uh, heterophilic antibodies affecting thyroid hormone. And we found that many of these patients actually there was a clinical consequence, either giving treatment, either, either giving iodine scan or a TRH test that was not indicated. And most of the methods that used uh, or detected interference were, for example, HANA blockers or method comparison or reduction of serum IgG. It could be detected but after giving some treatment or giving some uh, investigation that was not needed. The presence of heterophilic antibodies should be clearly indicated in the patient's profile because they persist for a long time and they could affect the results of different assays, for example, cardiac enzymes. More interestingly, uh, there was a case report that it could, be, could cause the placenta interfering with thyroid function test in the, uh, the newborn. And this is a case report from 1981 where transient neonatal hyperthyroidopenemia due to the presence of heterophilic antibodies were found in the plasma of infants and their mothers. Having talked about heterophilic antibodies, let's move to the macro TSH. We may hear of, uh, we may have heard of macrohormone. We may have heard it in the uh, context of macroprolactinemia. Macrohormone is a high molecular weight hormone which is conjugated with immunoglobulins. It is inert, it does not have any hormonal activity, and so therefore it does not need any treatment. Macro TSH, the same principle. The large circulating form of TSH composed of the monomeric TSH that we know, complexed with autoimmune anti-TSH antibodies. The reason for this antibody is not known now. Normal weight of TSH is 3 3 kilo Dalton. However, with being macro TSH, the weight may go up to 200 kilo Dalton. What is the effect of this high molecular weight? We are going to see. First, reduced biological activity. Patients are clinically euthyroid. The cause of reduced biological activity is due to the fact that they are confined into the vascular component, they are confined in the intravascular component, they cannot leave the blood vessel because of the high molecular weight. If they leave the blood vessels, antibodies are going to prevent the TSH from binding to the receptors. They persist for a long period of time because they have high molecular weight, they have reduced renal clearance. Immunal activity is variable reduced compared to the native TSH, and they are spiritually elevated to a variable degree using different immunoassays, and there is low recovery of added TSH. How prevalent are they? Uh, this is another study which measured, uh, which tried to measure uh, the presence of macro TSH in 500 samples, and it was found that it, the incidence was only Six per thousand, 0.6%. Macro TSH leads to artificial TSH elevations, which do not correlate clinically and can cause unnecessary management. Again, they have elevated TSH, normal thyroid hormone levels, and no clinical symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. Mills use the cutoff point of 10. Uh, to suspect the presence of macro TSH. If the TSH is high, more than 10, and 3 to 4 and 3 to 3 are normal, we can suspect that this patient may have a normal thyroid, a normal uh, symptoms. There are no symptoms or signs, so we can suspect that this patient may have a macro TSH. This cutoff point is not perfect because an, in case series, we have found patients having a TSH of 5.1, and this small rise was due to macro TSH. But chemically, it mimics subclinical hypothyroidism. It may lead to inappropriate levothyroxine therapy. The most important thing here is if we give levothyroxine treatment, this edge will not 
will just be elevated. It will go down. So if you give levothyroxine treatment, yes, it will go down. And this, this is happens actually for clinical hypothyroidism. It's different from heterophilic antibodies. If you give and if you give treatment in heterophilic antibodies, TSH will be resistly will be resistly high. So a decrease in plasma TSH in response to levothyroxine treatment therapy does not exclude the presence of macro TSH. Here another case series of around thirteen patients who uh, who who were found to have macro TSH, and most of them, except for one, had no clinical symptoms or signs. TSH was as high as 800 in one patient and as low as 5.1 in another patient. Interestingly, we are interested, we get interested in one patient of them. This particular patient had manifestations of hyperthyroidism, clinical examination consistent with Graves, antibody testing, was consistent with ab antibodies. However, SH was high, was 9.7. And this high TSH was due to macro TSH. And this is very interesting because if we read this case report, we may find that all the manifestations were pointing to hyperthyroidism, weight loss, tachycardia, and tremors. 84 and 33 were markedly elevated. However, the TSH was 9.7. So actually, we thought of something like TSH secreting adenoma, which we have heard of it yesterday. However, they found TSH receptor antibodies elevated. They revised the, T and the antibody status. It was elevated. So they gave treatment to Arbimazole, and they did not think of macro TSH except very late. So this is a very strange story and very strange case report. Laboratory-wise, no routine TSH immunoassay can disclose the presence of macro TSH. So we should ask the laboratory, we are thinking of macro TSH, please do something. And the lab can think of polyethylene glycol as a screening method. If we add polyethylene glycol, the macro TSH will get precipitated and the supernatant will include free TSH only. So polyethylene glycol mediated precipitation is used for screening. And we know this because we use it in macroprolactinemia. We use it in macroprolactinemia. However, the gold standard, the best thing to do is filtration chromatography to the various fractions of TSH according to their molecular weight. The small uh, uh, portions come from, the small molecules come at one part and the large molecules come another part. So we can differentiate between the high molecular weight uh, SH of, of weight 100 kilodalton and the small ones of weight 30 kilodalton. I'm not going through this again. This all the three the studies that showed us macro TSH, and we see here that most important uh, thing to do was was gel filtration chromatography and ethylene glycol. What is the clinical impact? This is from Fabrice, uh, and Fabrice has shown us. In 50% of the case reports we have heard about, there was a clinical impact, the most important of which is giving levothyroxine treatment unnecessarily. And others was like doing a scan, decrease or decrease the levothyroxine dose. However, 42% of the case reports did not mention any clinical consequence. So the 50% here is underestimated. So there is a clinical impact. My take home messages at, uh, at the end is that interference in immunostates is common, is, uh, is not common. However, we should be suspected. It should be suspected. It is often undefined by the laboratory routine quality assurance check. It should be suspected if there is incongruent clinical presentation and laboratory tests. And the clinician should be actively encouraged to conduct the laboratory, to contact the laboratory in case of any doubt about a result. Again, we, not, we should not leave the lab tests uh, for granted. We should always think of the clinical scenario, as Dr. Samir said, because lab tests do lie. This is the case of the heterophil and And thank you. Thank you. Uh.